So RDEB is an absolutely terrible, painful disease. What happens is there's a single protein mutation in patients that cause their layers of skin to detach. So I can use an analogy to describe this. Think of it like Velcro. So Velcro has these hoops at the top, and then there's like a lattice at the bottom, and they stick together. It's not unlike skin. We have these structures called anchoring fibrils, and they're hoops that come down from the, the epidermal layer and bind it to the collagen fibers, fibers of the dermal layer, and they keep our layer of skin together in healthy skin. Uh, in these children, type 7 collagen is what makes up these anchoring fibrils, and when they're deficient or if it's missing, the area of the skin floats on top of one another, and if you get some lateral friction, it leads to a blister. Blisters leads to wounds. Eventually, they become chronic, and then they spread, obviously, because the skin is very unstable. And the way it looks is these children, and, and adults as well, have wounds all over their body. A lot of them are non-healing. They're very painful. Uh, and where it really is problematic is when it leads to squamous cell carcinoma, which is the number one uh, mortality reason for these children and for these patients. So around ages of 30, about 76% mortality rate. Uh, the, uh, right now, there's no approved uh, therapies in the U.S. There's no FDA-approved therapies. Right now, palliative care, so wound management, home care, bandaging, uh, and sepsis baths, like with Clorox, just to keep the bio burden level down, and a lot of surgeries, finger separation surgeries, because the finger is confused from the disease. There's also esophageal dilatation, so stretching the esophagus. It affects the oral mucosa as well. And, um, you know, the goal here is can we provide a genetic change, a genetic sort of um, approach to replace this protein using their own cells because they are autologous so the rejection rate is obviously not there and address these wounds locally so we'll address this locally by injecting in the region sub intradermally around these wounds and hope we see a, a wound healing change in that area so this is our lead program so our most advanced um, we've had a very busy last six months on this program so i'll give a, an update on, on the progress in 2018 we released some data in our phase one patients showing good safety profile and also uh, positive trends in wound healing and pharmacology which led us at the end of the year to a type c and then into early in this year in march a type b end of phase two meeting so although we've been enrolling phase two we've just started dosing our patients we actually have seven enrolled we have two dosed. The FDA took our meeting so we can start having the discussion about a phase three design, which is exactly what we've done. So we've now have designed a phase three trial protocol. We announced it recently, what the design looks like. It's on our corporate deck as well, and I can talk about it in a moment. Um, so that is actually imminent. We'll be starting that trial coming up very soon. Uh, we actually just last week received RMAT for this indication as well, which is FDA's breakthrough designation for regenerative medicine therapies. And so obviously we've had a very good working relationship with the agency moving this through. So phase three coming up shortly. We've announced that we think we'll have the data, um, what we'll have enrollment and dosing complete sometime in third quarter 2020, have the primary output because it's a 12-week primary endpoint sometime in the fourth quarter, and we've been targeting 2021 for a BLA. So, yeah, really starting to map that program out towards approval.